Hey guys, Nick here, and today we're going to take a look at the main topic of Physics 1, forces and Newton's three laws. Um, as a result, as a side note, this will be a long video because it'll cover probably multiple lectures worth of material. Um, things such as friction, normal force, uh, tension in ropes um, are often taught separately, but I'm going to combine it all into one video so everything is in here. Um, now the main idea, main kind of question that this lesson will allow you to answer is, if you push on an object, let's say a five kilogram box, with a certain strength, um, let's say you measure the strength of your push, your force applied in newtons, let's say you push on a five kilogram box with 20 newtons, it's going to allow us to calculate the answer to the question, how fast will the box start to accelerate along the table due to your push? As of right now, you can't answer that, but Newton's laws will allow us to answer that question. Um, now, as with all the big things in physics, there are significant pros and significant cons to this topic. Uh, the most important con to be aware of and not be scared by is that it can be really difficult to pick up at first. And I had a lot of trouble understanding how to do this topic at first. However, don't despair if it doesn't make sense instantly. It's not supposed to make sense instantly. What I want you to do is if you find yourself getting really, really bamboozled, head to the simple examples, see what's going on, and see if you can infer what's happening from those very simple examples. That'll likely be your way into the topic. It was my way into the topic and really the whole inspiration behind this channel. Um, so again, do not despair no matter how lost you think you are. You are only really five to ten minutes from really getting a solid grasp on it. So do not give up on this topic. And the corresponding pro is that once you do get it, you're going to understand it forever. And perhaps more importantly, people in your class are going to need your help because this is a very difficult topic. And if you do get it, people need you. Another con, which sort of contributes to this first con, is it's often taught as one of the first things in physics. Um, something like energy and momentum are much easier um, but it's very often taught first and that's for good reason because you sort of need it to do momentum and energy almost allows you to be it allows you to cut too many corners here another con is that there's an insane amount of possible problems and a lot of them are very very difficult um, so it's very difficult to cover all the examples at once so as usual I'm gonna lay out the foundation that should hopefully allow you to get at least an educated start on most problems. Most won't be more than one additional step, if that, from the process I give here. Now, the last pro is that forces in Newton's laws are actually super useful. You'll see them everywhere. Um, it's really, you know, if, if you have an object being pushed, you're going to be using Newton's laws. Um, so you really we will see this in other places, and it'll also extend throughout the rest of physics, um, of the physics curriculum this semester. So it really does pay a lot of dividends to get a solid understanding up front. All right, with that, we're going to jump in to the first topic, which is Newton's three laws. Okay. Now, Newton's first law and Newton's third law they're relatively simple and we don't actually use them that often. It's the second law that's the big guy, so I'm going to write it in our handy dandy galaxy pen. Um, I'll go over them really quickly. Um, the first law is sort of contained within the second law. Um, the second law tells you about the first law in addition to other things, but it's helpful to remember and it's sometimes asked as a test question. Roughly speaking, the first uh, law says that if you have an object and it has no total force, no net force. I'll explain what this means in a second. So if it has no net force acting on it, it doesn't accelerate. And I'll explain what that means in the context of these problems in a second. Um, so all net force means is that, let's say if you have a box and one person pushes it 10 newtons this way 
and another person pushes it 10 newtons to the left, these forces cancel out and you say, oh, yeah, there are some forces acting, but the net force after cancellation is zero. So you can really read net as after cancellation. Okay, and it doesn't accelerate means that it maintains its current velocity. So if an object starts out being still and it has no net force, it stays still. If an object is moving with a certain speed before the push, it stays at that speed and direction, that velocity, after the push. Okay, so sometimes you'll see this law written as an object in motion stays in motion. That's just restating this, that if you have some initial speed, you keep that speed because there's no net push on you. And an object at rest stays at rest. That's this case here. If you have an object sitting still and post cancellation there's no forces acting on it, it's going to stay sitting still. It won't accelerate at all. It won't change velocity at all. I'm going to skip the second law since that'll be the main topic of the video. Third law, we barely ever, ever use it. It's about like the concept of equal and opposite reaction force pairs. Um, so just as an example of what this would be is, um, let's say you're standing on your friend's shoulders. Uh, I'm going to have to do some weird legs here. Okay, all it's saying is that your friend feels a push downwards from your legs and you feel his arms supporting you, pushing you upwards, and it just says that the size of this and the size of this are the same. So basically, when two things touch, usually, the contact slash touching force, which is, in physics, it's called normal force, usually. is the same on each object. Um, now I will say that this is a dangerous law to even teach. It often leads to people accidentally drawing both of these arrows as being felt by the same person. Um, we'll get into some examples and I'll explain you know, how to avoid making this mistake, but I will say keep in mind it's dangerous it often tries to trick you into adding extra arrows. Or drawing extra forces that aren't there. So we'll take the third law with a grain of salt, leave it there, and come back to the second law. Now, the second law specifically is what's going to allow us to answer this motivating question, which is, I push an object with a certain strength of push, how fast does it accelerate? And the second law says, pretty simply, oh, it's easy. You take the strength of the push, you divide it by the mass of the object, and that tells you how fast the object accelerates. Seems simple enough, right? In this example, I have a push of 20 newtons I have a mass of the object being pushed of 5 kilograms and that tells me what the acceleration is. So in this case it's 20 over 5 will give us 4 meters per second squared. It's a relatively straightforward concept when you view it in the context of this simple example. And if at any point in the video you start to get really confused or unsettled, this is really the starting point here. This is the first point I want you to go back to. And just remember that all the second law is allowing us to do is that 
oh, hey, we know all the forces that are pulling on this block. Cool. All we have to do is divide by the block's mass in kilograms, and that instantly tells us how fast the block will start to accelerate as a result of those pushes. Okay. And I'm just going to write this in standard form. For whatever reason, people like to move m over to the other side. So this law is often rewritten as instead of f divided by m equals a, people will write it with the m multiplied over to the other side. So this is Newton's second law. And of all the things I will ever write in this course, now there's only one thing that I'll ever claim is more important than this. Um, and that will come during conservation of energy. But this is the equation you will write most in physics by a multiplicative factor of two or maybe even three. Okay, so F equals MA um, is an equation that should definitely be drilled into your brain so you can recite it to remember that, um, to remember which variable goes where. For example, that it's not A equals FM. Okay, great. Okay, um, I'm going to do another simple example to help illustrate how you would use the second law. Um, it's going to be very similar to the previous example, so if you're totally comfortable with that, feel free to skip this. But it is really useful to have a bunch of examples here um, in case you don't get it immediately like I didn't when I first learned it. So another example will be a box of mass 2 kilograms is pushed with a force of 30 newtons to the right. What is its acceleration? Okay, so we just have a diagram of a box sitting on a table of mass 2 kilograms, and there's either a push or a pull, it doesn't really matter, of size 30 newtons there. And the question is, how fast does the box start to accelerate? Because as you push it, it'll start to move. And if you keep pushing it, it'll gradually speed up and start going faster. Now, Newton's law says that all you have to do is, again, this is the same as the equation. You take the force, divide by mass, and it gives you A. We've just rearranged it for some sad reason that makes it less understandable, but this is the way it'll be on your equation sheet. So all we've done, is, or all we need to do, is plug in what the force pushing on the object is, what the mass of the object is, and that'll tell us how fast it starts to accelerate. So in this case, we have a force of 30 newtons. The mass of the block is 2 kilograms. Okay, we have one equation and one number we want to find, A, so we're set. All we need to do is divide both sides by 2. And that tells us then that A equals 30 divided by 2 is 15 meters per second squared. And again, technically you could say it, it starts accelerating to the right. But you don't really have to. It's kind of assumed from the problem. Okay, great. So we found the acceleration of the box based off of the push, that was F, and the, uh, the mass of the box that was being pushed on. Okay. Let's do another example. This one will be a little bit more difficult. Um, and it'll actually lead to a little modification of this formula that really, it should be F net will tell you MA, right? Like if there will, if there will be a force that is fighting the push to the right, you'll want to subtract that off, get like the overall force after cancellation, and then do the division by M. So let's do an example of that. And I'll, I'll title this example, why is it F net slash what does F net mean rather than F? Okay, so we're going to have a very similar example. We're going to have a box of mass 2 kilograms on a table. There's going to be still a pull, or a push or a pull, it doesn't matter, of 30 newtons to the right. But this time, there's going to be a second pull. Maybe one guy is trying to pull it with a rope this way, 30 newtons, but another slightly weaker guy is pulling it to the left with strength 20 newtons. So obviously this guy will win, but he doesn't get to use all of his 30 newtons to pull the box. He basically, 
he basically wastes 20 newtons fighting the guy on the left for the pull. So vaguely, we expect that the overall force will be less, but still to the right. So let's do it in equation form. Now again, if you prefer, you could write force net, and then you just divide by the mass to get the acceleration. However, I'm going to do it the standard way, since this is the way that will be more useful in the end, and it's also the more common way. Okay, so the mass of the box is obviously 2, we can plug that in. Acceleration, we're trying to find this number, so we're going to leave it as a variable and hopefully find its value at the end. Okay, and net force. Now remember that net means post-cancellation. Oops. So in this case, our net force that happens after you cancel off the 20, right? You have 30 pull this way, but he wastes 20 of his energy slash pull fighting this guy. So at the end of the day, what's left over is a 10 Newton pull to the right. So this is the leftover or net force. And strictly how you can do this is you take 30, so the force to the right, and you subtract off how many poles are pointing to the left. And I'm putting forces in parentheses, um, because if there are multiple, you subtract off anything pointing to the left, and you add up anything pointing to the right. And this will tell you the net force which is just going to be 10, as we had sort of intuitively guessed just by, you know, you kill off 20 from 30, what's left 10. But here it is in equation form, right? Forces to the right minus forces to the left. So we're left with the net force of just 10 equals 2a. Divide both sides by 2, and you get that a equals 5 meters per second squared. Whereas in the last example, where there was no pull to the right, the acceleration was 15 meters per second squared. So the effect of this has been to basically slow down the speeding up of the box, right? Because the net force is no longer 30 to the right, it's only 10 to the right. Okay. Um, something I'll talk about just for a second here, in the second part of this video, maybe I'll make it a new video, um, I'm going to tell you about free body diagrams, um, but really we've already been doing them in secret, so I'll tell you a little bit about them here. So diagrams like this of the box in question and then all the poles acting on it you know, maybe in a different problem there are vertical poles as well. Diagrams like this are called free body diagrams. Oops. Okay, I don't think I'll be able to close my quotes. Oh, I can. Also no abbreviated as FBDs. Okay. Um, now, there's a lot of like rather strict rules for how you should draw them. Really what's important is you draw a picture of the object usually drawn as a box or sometimes a dot but it isn't really too strict. You can draw it however you want. It should just be some simple object at the center and then pulls or pushes on the object. By the way, I don't know if I strictly defined it. Maybe you've heard it in class. This is what a force is. Just any, any push or pull on an object, you call it a force. And you draw these as arrows. sort of emanating from the object. And it's good to label them with their size. Okay. 
let's do a third example here in formal equation form. So up until now, I've kind of been doing it in multiple ways. I've been writing f net over m, um, and maybe I use some arguments for, oh, the 30 and the 20. You sort of see why the net force is going to be 10. Let's do one in full equation format, just so you can see what it looks like when you skip writing out those intuitive steps. Your professor probably does these already. He probably skipped them whether or not everybody was ready for it. Okay, an example is going to be, and it's pretty much going to be a repeat of the last example just with slightly different numbers. We're going to have a 4 kilogram box on a table, a 50 newtons push forwards, a 10 newton push backwards, and the question is, what is the acceleration, like usual? Sorry, I didn't draw these arrows to scale very much. You don't have to, but it's helpful for visualizing. Okay, so again, I'm not going to write out the intuitive, oh, 10 of this kills off 10 of this, so should, we should be left with 40. I'm going to write it in just true classroom notation. So in classroom notation, you would write out this equation because you know this is how you convert the pushes into finding what the acceleration is. Okay, and now remember F net is forces right minus the size of forces to the left. Okay, so forces to the right are 50 forces to the right is 10, so this number right here is F net, and that equals the mass of the object for times its acceleration, which we don't yet know, so we leave it as A. Okay, um, 50 minus 10 is 40. Now I divide both sides by 4 to get A by itself, and therefore A is 10 meters per second squared. Okay, this is an example for how you do it in class. You write out the second law, which is this equation relating force and acceleration. You plug in numbers, or I suppose first off the work is usually rewriting what F net actually is in terms of the arrows that you see on your object. And then once you've plugged in numbers, all that's left is, you know, divide by the mass to get A. Awesome. Okay. One more example, just to show the utility of equation form. This time I'm going to tell you the acceleration and ask you what force is going on here. And you'll see that if you try and reason your way through it, you might get to the answer. But if you write everything into the equation, it becomes really clear, oh, I just have to move this number over to the other side, and it's a couple step problem. All right, so here's an example. And again, this is going to be finding a force if you're given the acceleration, which is the opposite of how we've been doing it so far. Okay, so the problem is going to be there's, oops, um, there's going to be a box of mass 2 kilograms. There's some unknown force here that you don't know, and the question is going to be find this. There's a pull backwards of size 10 newtons, and the acceleration is five meet oops, five meters per second squared to the right. Implicitly, by not saying negative five, I've sort of communicated the acceleration is to the right. All right. So again, if you try and reason through this by using just like, oh, what, what force should it be so that when I divide by mass it equals 5, it, it can be a little bit difficult. But if you just trust the equation form, you'll see that it becomes really easy if you just, if you, um, just approach it that way. So again, we're going to write our starting point, which is always this equation. And as usual, really, we only have one task, which is to replace F net by this expression, which I'll be writing a lot. Force is pointing right minus force is pointing to the left. Okay, so what forces go to the right in this diagram right here of the block on the table? Well, we have this unknown force of size F. 
Now, before I would have told you, oh, F equals 50, and you would have written positive 50 on this side of the equation. But for now, I haven't told you what F is, so we're just going to leave it as a number that we don't know. All right, that's all of our forces to the right. And the force to the left we have is 10 newtons pulling to the left. And that's all we have. So that side of the equation has been rewritten appropriately. And this will equal to mass, which is 2 kilograms, times the acceleration, which is 5 meters per second squared. And now if you look at this equation and say, can I find F? Well, the answer is, yeah, you have one equation one variable you don't know, so it's just a matter of moving stuff over to the other side and maybe dividing, you don't have to in this case, um, to find what number f is. So let's go do that. Let's see, 2 times 5 is equal to 10, and now I add 10 to both sides of the equation. Okay, this side is now 20, so I get that the force needed to give it that acceleration is 20 newtons, abbreviated n. And if you go back and check if this gives you the right number, right, so if you plug in 20 here, all right, the net force is now, let's see, you start with 20 to the right, and again, right here, I'm just checking that this is the right answer. We've already finished the problem. Let's check that this gives us the right A. So I start with 20, but 10 of it gets killed off by this force it has to fight. So the leftover force is 10 to the right, and Newton's law says you take that total force after cancellation of 10, you divide it by the mass of 2, and you should get the acceleration out. Yeah, 10 divided by 2 does, gives us, does give us 5. So 20 is the answer after all, and we've checked it. Great. Now, if you followed along to here, you've gotten all the basic components of forces. Once we get into 2D problems, there will be little extensions of this, which might be a little difficult, but if you've made it to this checkpoint, know that you're probably like 75, 70% of the way there. So if you've made it this far, hang on for the next part once we get towards multiple directions. And don't feel the need to rehash your whole understanding if you've understood it up to this part. There's only very minor adjustments, so good job on making it this far. Okay. We're going to shift gears just a little bit, and we're going to look at forces in the vertical direction. Again, this video will be slightly disorganized just by virtue of there's so much to cover, and it, there isn't really a clear order in which you should cover it. You just need to cover it all. So first thing I'm going to touch on is the weight force. Okay, so the weight force is how hard gravity, aka the Earth, pulls on an object. And this is important in Newtons, right? A Newton is a unit of force, just like a meter is a like a unit of distance. Now Newton is telling you how big your force is. You could have things like kilo newtons, thousands of newtons, um, forces on cars, springs, for example. If you guys um, have ever tuned a car um, or seen your cars load, it'll tell you the spring is rated in kilonewtons. Okay, so how hard gravity pulls on an object in newtons? There's a simple formula that you're going to use a lot, and it's that the weight this letter W. So I'll say size of the weight force. How you get it is it isn't just the mass of the object because it's obvious that bigger objects like they feel the earth more like if you take a dumbbell it's getting pulled towards the earth pretty hard compared to a feather. So it's not just their mass though you have to multiply it by the number 9.8. Okay. This is the same thing as G, but I'm going to leave it as 9.8 because people tend to misuse G or forget that it's there. Um, so I'm going to leave it as 9.8. Um, but you will later see me write out W equals MG. And again, this is the traditional formula, but it tends to be forgotten. So for the next couple minutes at least, I'll use 9.8 in there. 
Now, again, if you just mistakenly use the mass, you're going to say, oh, the force on this object due to gravity is 2 kilograms. And you say, wait, wait, record scratch, record scratch, hold on. Forces should be in newtons. How do I have something in kilograms? And then you remember, oh, wait, I can't just use the mass. It, it doesn't, it isn't in newtons. It doesn't make sense. I have to multiply by 9.8 to convert the kilograms into how many newtons of force there actually is. Okay, so just as a quick example, what's the gravitational force, aka the weight force, on a 60 kilogram human? Now again, the answer is not just 60 newtons or 60 kilograms, because you need to multiply it by 9.8 to get the correct answer. So the weight force will be 60 kilograms times 9.8, and that'll give us a number in newtons. And it seems I left my calculator on the other side of the room. Oh, there we go. Okay, 60 times 9.8 is 588 newtons. And again, this is a force, this is the strength of the pull on you by the Earth. Okay, um... Next, probably the next relevant example is going to be talking about normal force, which sort of naturally appears next to weight. Now, normal force is a bit tricky to get a hard definition on. But you'll get a good sense of what it is. Roughly, as I had said above, it's like a force between two objects are, that are touching. Um, and really the function is, or actually let me save that comment for in a second. For example, the typical normal force is a person or a block sitting on let's say the ground. The weight force, pull, let's do the block first because it's simpler. The weight force yanks the block down and tries to get it to start moving down through the ground but the ground says hold up I'm already here and it pushes back and the block feels this support on its bottom. It feels hey there's something under me touching me pushing me upwards. So the weight force points down and the normal force, again, it's sort of due to the fact that it is touching the ground and trying to phase into it, but the ground says, buddy, buddy, you, you can't be, you know, you can't start moving through me, so it kind of resists the block trying to move into it, and it pushes upwards so the block just sits still. Similarly, when you're standing, let's say you stand on one leg for simplicity, you are being pulled downwards by the force of gravity and the ground says hey buddy I know you're trying to phase into me but you're not allowed in here so the normal force pushes you back upwards it, it's sort of a support force you can you'll also hear it called that sometimes And I'll say it's usually when object is on the ground. The thing that keeps the object from moving into the ground, that's the normal force. Um, another example is if you slap your hand onto a desk. Uh, this is going to be really tricky to draw. I'm going to do stick hands because everyone knows real hands are tough. Hey, if you slap your hand onto a desk, your hand's weight slash the fact that it was already moving. Or let, let's just say you rest your hand on a desk. Your hand is being pulled down, 
but if you actually do this, put your hand on the desk, you'll feel that your skin is touching the desk. The fact that you're touching the desk, that is the normal force pushing upwards on your palm, okay? So that's why it's called the touching force. If you poke something and you feel it, that is the normal force. And again, it prevents you from phasing into the object. If that force weren't there, there would be no resistance to your hand just floating into the table. So again, it's kind of tough to get 100% definition, but we'll see some examples of this in practice. Okay, as an example of how to calculate normal force, let's do a different number. Let's do a five kilogram block sitting on a desk. Okay, and the question will be, what is the normal force between the block and the desk. So like how much support force does the block feel from the desk? And let me actually move this example down so I can draw. Okay, so if we just label what forces we have going on, the block, it doesn't have anything else pushing it besides the desk and its own weight. Now its own weight force right here how big is the pull due to gravity? Is it five or is it something else? Now remember, it's five times 9.8, right? The weight force is mass times 9.8. So if we do this five times 9.8, by the way, your professors might use 10 instead to round. We get that this force is of size 49 newtons. And we don't really know what the normal force is, but, and now there are two ways you can do this. The first way is that if the object is just sitting still, if this block doesn't start to accelerate either through the desk or it doesn't start to float off the desk, the total forces it's got to be zero. so that the block isn't starting to accelerate. Actually, actually, I'll say since there's no acceleration. Okay, so really roughly speaking, this just says, oh, this force and this force should be the same size. just pointed in opposite directions. That way the total net force is zero after they cancel out. That way the object doesn't start accelerating magically. If you want to do this in equation form, you're still allowed to use this equation for the y direction as well. The only difference is that now this is going to be forces pointing up minus forces pointing down. Before it was forces pointing right minus forces pointing left, right? We had that 30 newtons to the right minus 20 newtons to the left. Here we're going to have normal force pointing up minus the 49 newton weight force pointing down and that will equal m times the acceleration However, since the block is just sitting there on the desk, it's not starting to accelerate, right? If it had some acceleration along the vertical direction, either it would be starting to float upwards off the desk slowly, or it would be starting to float downwards through the desk. So this whole right-hand side is zero. We move 49 to the other side, and we get Fn equals 49 newtons up, just like before. Now again, this is the strict equation way to get this intuitive result. Now, this intuitive result is better for these simple problems. It's really easy, reduces the chance of algebra mistakes. However, the strict equation way you'll see will be more useful when sometimes equations will be tangled up in one another, like you'll, you'll have variables in this equation that appear in the x direction equation as well. Um, so you'll see what I mean, but it's useful to understand both approaches here.
Okay. Now, as another example, oh, by the way, before I do this example, I just want to point out, in this very specific example, the normal force equaled the weight here. So I'll say it equaled weight. I'm going to write this in blood red in this very specific case of just a simple block sitting on a desk, nothing else pushing on it, no, no extra ropes, no diagonal poles or anything. It's only in this very specific case. And in general, this is not true. Okay, we're going to see in this next example a case where normal force does not equal weight. Okay, people, this is one of the most common mistakes made. People blindly will plug in normal force equals weight when it's not always true. You have to go through this strict equation way, and sometimes you'll find that it's not true. And we're going to find that here. Okay, an example is going to be there's a block sitting on a table mass 4 kilograms and someone decides to push it downwards so in addition to its weight force there's going to be a downwards push of strength 20 newtons okay and the question is what is the normal force between the desk and the block just like before so again there's a 20 newtons external push maybe some guy is trying to squeeze the block onto the desk to crush it and we're going to try and find what the normal force is. So if we look at our block here, we have this external push, the 20. We know it's being pulled downwards by its weight. And the table, the fact that it's touching the table, that's a normal force. And the block isn't accelerating anywhere. All right, first let's just chip away at this. What's the weight force here? And it's not 4, it's 4 times 9.8 right weight is equal to mg if you plug that in your calculator you get 39.2 newtons okay and let's just write out the newton second law and remember it does work for the up down direction and it'll tell you the up down acceleration okay and let's see what we get Okay, uh, upwards forces minus downwards forces, remember, that's how you simplify this F net business. So upwards forces are normal force. Any others? Nope. All right, we have a downwards force of size 39.2, and we have another downwards force, so another subtraction off of size 20 and that equals m times the up and down acceleration. Now just like last time the block is just sitting still on the desk so it doesn't have any acceleration up or down. If it did it would be starting to float off the table or float into the table which would be bad. So based on the physical picture we know that a equals zero. Okay at this point let's see we can move both these numbers over to the other side add them up and we get that the normal force is 59.2 newtons which is not equal to just the weight right because there was this additional push trying to force the object through the desk the desk had to push back extra hard to say hey buddy you're, you're not phasing into me without my permission so the normal force that the desk squeezed the block back with was 20 newtons greater than just the weight force Again, so here's an example of this thing failing. Normal force didn't equal weight because there was other vertical stuff going on. Excellent. All right, guys, if I were you, I'd take a quick short break there. Um, we're going to come back and do friction force. I'm actually just coming back from a break myself, but I'll cut it in the video. Um, so yeah, I'd pause the video, take a couple minutes, refresh yourself, and then get ready for friction. Okay, so welcome back to the friction section. Okay, um, now I'll do my best to go into detail with friction, 
Um, this video is already going to be pretty long. I don't want to make it obscenely long, but I'll see what I can do with this. Um, so the main idea of friction, now we're already familiar with it from day-to-day -day life. Um, let, let's say we're trying to push a cardboard box, big box. We're like, ah, trying to push it, but it keeps feeling like if you have, we have to work against something. It's getting pushed back by something despite our efforts to push on it. So the idea of friction is that it's this retarding force, meaning that it pushes against motion. Oops. However, and I'm going to cross this out in Galaxy Pen, sometimes friction points in weird directions that we don't expect. And in particular, I'm going to point out problems involving propulsion or similar themes like driving a car or something. So friction will usually do what you expect, but in a few cases, which I will point out to you, friction is going to point in the opposite direction, and there'll be a way you can really solidly tell which direction it's pointing. But usually, it's going to push against the direction you're pushing an object. Okay. Now, there's an actual equation that you can do of how to find the strength that friction will push back with. So the strength of this pushback, how can we find it? The equation, and this is, it isn't derived from anywhere, it's just, um, it's just the way the world works, is that friction force, and I'm going to put a little semicolon, I'm going to write maximum here, it equals some number, I'm going to call it mu, times the normal force between the objects. Okay, um, so in this example, let's say I'm pushing a 10 kilogram box, and by the way, I should mention mu is called the coefficient of friction, and it depends on the materials like the physical materials. Is the box cardboard? Is the surface asphalt or carpet? And it's depending on the materials in contact. So it'll depend on this surface and this surface. And why that is, is if you take a magnifying glass in here, oops, you'll see that what's actually happening is that there are little jagged edges on the, the let's say, the carpet that you're pushing on. Or actually, let's do asphalt. There's little gravelly grooves on it. And the cardboard box is pretty smooth, but it's also not totally smooth. And these little jagged edges, they rub against one another, they break off, and they just obstruct each other from moving. So it's this sliding of this one past this one that creates this retarding force. And the sizes of those grooves and stuff, that is how you determine the coefficient of friction but you will always be given this. Or in rare problems, you'll be asked to find what it is from other numbers, but you never actually calculate it from which materials are they. That is all collected by some scientists who just run experiments on it. Okay, so back to the problem at hand. Let's find the friction force going on in this scenario of you pushing a 10 kilogram box. So. Let's say I tell you that between these two surfaces, mu equals 0.3. This is a worthwhile thing to note. It's usually between like 0 0.01 and, I don't know, maybe 1, but there's no reason it can't be above 1. Let's say it's maybe between 1 and, I don't know, 2.5. Those are typical numbers. If you get a coefficient of friction of 10 billion, something's up. Um, but back to the problem here. So in this case, we have a mu oops, 
sorry, I need to catch up. We have a mu of 0.3 and the normal force between these objects. Now, this is the simple case of there's no other up down funny business. So in this specific case, the weight or the normal force is just the weight, which is 10 kilograms times 9.8, so 98 newtons. So if we do 0.3 times 98, we get that the friction force, the maximum possible friction force is 29.4 newtons. Okay, this is if friction tries as hard as it can. So as an example of how we can use this then, if we do a push I'm going to use the same box of size 10 kilograms and it's pushed with a force of 50 newtons along a carpeted surface with mu equals 0.3 find the acceleration. Okay, now usually you can assume that friction is trying its hardest. It's rare that you have a problem where you push less hard than the friction force, but you'll know you've done something wrong because you'll get that the box starts accelerating backwards um, if the friction force is stronger. So usually you'll be able to ignore the case that it isn't working as hard as it can. So we'll draw our diagram here. Sometimes I'll do a jagged edge just to remind myself, hey, there's friction there. Okay, there's a force of 50 here. Now, we calculated what FF was above, so if I wanted, I could do this problem by using our previous result, but I'm actually not gonna. I'm gonna leave it like that for now, just to show us how you might do it in typical equation form. Okay, so that's the friction force due to this contact right here. Let's see, there's the weight force of the box itself. And then there's the normal force because the ground is pushing the box up. Okay. And this is gonna motivate the next section of this video, which is gonna be like a big systematic process for doing problems with arrows in multiple directions, which will comprise most of the difficult problems and most of the problems really that you'll do. Now, in simple equation form, or for this specific problem, I'm not gonna do the full process. I'm just gonna show you how, what to do when there's two directions involved. So separately from the left and right stuff, we're able to say, oh, based on just the fact that we have a box sitting on a table with no vertical acceleration, the normal force and the weight should be equal. And we know that the weight is the mass of 10 times 9.8, so perfect. We found that the normal force is 98 newtons. Boom. Okay, now we're asked about the left-right acceleration. So all we need to do is write out, sorry, I should do right, left instead of left, right, just to be consistent. All we need to do is take any arrows pointing to the right, so 50 Newtons, and you subtract off the size of the friction force. And that will tell you how big A is. Okay, now friction force, we know what friction force is when it's trying its hardest. It's, it's mu times normal force. Okay, and perfect, we know what the normal force is, so we can erase this variable and plug in 98. And we're given that mu equals 0.3. Okay, so all we gotta do is move stuff around now. Uh, if you plug this in your calculator, it's 29.4. Okay, 50 minus 29.4. All right, now I divide by 10. So the A 
sorry, I'm, I'm switching between left, right, and right, left. All, all this means is the acceleration along the horizontal direction. So A left to right, or A left right, the horizontal acceleration is 2.06 meters per second squared. Perfect. And that's your first problem involving multiple directions at once. And again, the key new feature of this was that we actually, instead of being told what this backwards force was, we calculated what it was because we first calculated what the normal force was, and that allowed us to just multiply by mu to get the associated friction force. Great. Now, one more example, which is going to be a little confusing at first, is going to be I'm going to have a box on top of another box, and I'm going to pull this lower box, and there's going to be friction, oops, oh my god, I just erased a lot. There's going to be friction between box A and B, and as a result, as you drag box B, box A is going to tag along with it. And the question is, what direction is the friction on block A? Now, again, usually friction opposes the direction of motion. But remember I said specifically in cases where there is some sort of propulsion going on where something maybe is being dragged forward by friction, you need to really be careful and investigate. So that's what we got to do here. Now, the method for really getting this is you imagine that the boxes have clothes on. specifically that they have like loose fitting clothes. You can just ask what direction do the clothes get like rumpled up in or crumpled in. Okay, so if we imagine that box A is, you know, wearing some pants or something, it's, it's going to be a little bit hard to draw um, in an actual lecture. I would show this to my students with my actual pants. But imagine you're sitting here. Imagine you're box A and you're sitting down. Let's say you're facing into the screen. Okay, so you're sitting down here waiting for something to happen. As you, box B, let's say this is a chair, gets dragged away from you, your pants sort of go with it, right? If you actually want to do this right now, sit on your chair or whatever you're sitting on right now, face the screen, and have someone else, or I guess you can try to do it yourself, have someone else pull the chair out to your right you'll see that your pants shift to the right. They get dragged with the chair. And what's causing that dragon, dragging is the friction between your pants and the chair. The friction is actually trying to bring you forward. So in this case, the answer is that the friction actually points forward on box A. Okay, so the next question we're going to address is a little bit different. I told you the friction that box A feels from this intersection right here is actually forwards, which is not what you expect. Let's apply this similar procedure, but again with the modification of you're going to imagine box B has hair on it instead of wearing clothes. Um, and we're going to use that to find what direction the friction block B feels due to block A being there. Now, the way you can do this is you take your hand and put it on top of your head and you push down rather hard, that's block B. Okay. Now you, without moving your hand at the same time, just moving your head, try to move your head to the right. Now what should have happened is your hair should be pulled to the left along with your hand a little bit as your head tried to squeak out from underneath and move to the right. 
So your hair should be pulled to the left now. After you moved, so this is your head, you try to move your head there, here was your hand, and your hair got tugged this way along with your hand. So that tells you that the friction force that block B feels on its quote unquote head is actually backwards. Okay, this is these two answers. The fact that they're different is super non intuitive. So if you need to, take another second and rewatch this example. Um, this will be important. Um, it comes up on tests, particularly. Now, another example that comes up really commonly is about the direction of friction um, with a car tire. So if you just imagine, here's your car tire. Okay, and the car's wheels turn that way due to propulsion. And again, that should set off alarm bells. Oh, propulsion. We, we better be really careful what direction friction is going. So obviously, the car starts speeding up going forward, and some force has to be creating that. It's technically the engine, but the motion is actually started by the tires. Um, so you sort of get an intuition that maybe the friction force is what's making it go forward. I mean, there's there's nothing else. Again, yes, the engine is there, but what the engine is doing is turning the tires. So you can't say, oh, it's the engine's force. You need to be really specific. The tires are what's touching the ground, so what force between the tires and ground are making the car go forward? Your only real option is friction, and let's use this method to check that that's correct. By the way, this is a common test question. And a common homework question. Okay. Uh, now this one's really tough for me to like explain to you guys without a visual, but you can just imagine if you try really hard to rotate this tire, what happens is that the rubber sort of like it, it bunches up over here as you try to keep turning it. This gets stretched really far and this stuff all sort of like piles up over here as you really crank the tire. This side sort of gets fattened by all the rubber that gets stuck there. So since everything gets bunched up slash pushed that way, you know that yes, the friction force is actually forward. In this specific case. Now again, sorry, this explanation isn't the best. It's really tough to do without physically being next to you and having a tire available. Um, I would ask your professor if you're confused about it. It doesn't pop up too often, but again, it does pop up on tests, so it's useful to remember. Okay, one more thing before we get into like the main free body diagram processes um, is we're going to talk about tension and rope. Now, this won't actually be too in depth. Um, Basically, the idea is that any force caused by a rope is usually called a tension force. So a force caused slash transmitted through a rope is called a tension force. So as an example, if you tie a rope to an object, and you pull with your hand over here, the object says, oh, I feel a rope attached to me. I'm getting pulled to the right by the rope. And you would label this as the force T, tension of the rope. If you have multiple blocks in like a duckling chain one after the other, you would say, oops, you would say this box, he feels a forwards tension pull from that rope, and he feels a rope attached over here, sort of dragging him backwards a little bit, so he feels another tension pulling backwards. This guy over here, he feels this rope attached to him, sort of dragging him forwards, and he feels the same rope, so tension two, dragging him in the other direction. Now, a quick comment here is that there's, at first, no reason to believe that each of those forces transmitted through the rope is the same, but it turns out that these are the same force.
So you can call them both T2. Yes, they do point in opposite directions. But the third law is what tells you this. Okay, again, it doesn't tell you that this rope, you should draw another T2 here. That's not it. That's the trap that Newton's third law tries to get you into. All Newton's third law tells you is that, hey, this block feels a pull here from the rope, and this other block, let's call this block B maybe, it feels a pull to the left from rope 2 or whatever we're calling it. And the third law just says, oh, this force that block A feels, it's the same size as the force that block B feels from that rope. Okay? You don't let the third law convince you into drawing these ghost forces over here, right? All the third law tells you is, are these forces really the same size? Oh, yeah, they are. And then, end of story there. Okay, at that point, the first component of the video ends. I think I'm going to cut it into another video so it doesn't get too long. Um, in the next part, we're going to go through the really systematic way of attacking complicated Newton's Law problems. And that's going to be strictly drawing the free body diagram, um, breaking um, components in, or breaking diagonal forces up into left to right, doing F equals MA along each direction, writing out a system of equations. If you've seen this in class, you know what I'm talking about, and you know that it can be pretty intimidating. But don't worry, we're going to go through it, decompose it, and I will see you there in the next one.